Welcome to this lecture about feline infectious peritonitis. In part one, we'll talk about what FIP is, the signalment, history and physical exam findings, and the pathogenesis of the disease. In part two, we'll cover diagnosis, treatment and prevention. So let me introduce you to Rory, a six-month-old male neutered Burmese cat. He was obtained from the breeder two months ago, and he had a history of mild self-limiting diarrhoea when he first came home. He's come to you today for lethargy and inappetence that's been going on for around a week. When you examine Rory, you find he's lost weight. He's got poor body and coat condition. He's got multiple firm, mobile abdominal masses, which you suspect to be enlarged lymph nodes. He's also got a distended fluid-filled abdomen, and this is also known as ascites. And his temperature is 39.7, making him pyrexic. At this point, Rory's problem list would be lethargy, inappetence, weight loss, pyrexia, ascites, and abdominal masses. Some of these signs are quite vague and would be difficult to investigate further, but ascites is a little more straightforward. So you decide to go for abdominal ultrasound and analysis of the fluid. The ultrasound finds that, as you suspected, his mesenteric lymph nodes are enlarged, and the effusion is found to be a non-septic exudate. So it contains neutrophils and macrophages. So diagnosis of FIP is notoriously difficult, especially to reach a definitive diagnosis. Often you rely on a combination of signalment, history, clinical signs, and carefully chosen supportive tests. And even at that point, sometimes the best you can reach is a presumptive diagnosis. So in this case, a presumptive diagnosis is exactly what was made, and he was presumptively diagnosed with FIP. We'll talk more in the next lecture about diagnostic options. So what is FIP? It's a disease of young pedigree cats, so peak age is six months to two years. And while any breed can get FIP, pedigrees do seem to be more susceptible. They're usually from multi-cat environments, so places like catteries and shelters. Typical signs of FIP can be quite vague, so things like weight loss, lethargy, pyrexia and icterus. They can be a bit more organ specific, so a mesenteric lymphadenomegaly like Rory had, renomegaly in large kidneys, um, or effusions. And FIP can also affect the nervous system um, with signs including ataxia and ocular signs. So FIP is caused by FIP virus, which is a coronavirus. Um, coronaviruses in cats come in two flavours, so you get the mild ubiquitous feline enteric coronavirus, or FECV, and then you get virulent FIP virus. And it's thought that FECV mutates into FIPV within the animal. So you get infection with FECV. While the animal's infected, the FECV mutates to develop tropism for monocytes. While in monocytes, it acquires further mutations um, to become more virulent and becomes FIPV. And the FIPV is able to rapidly replicate within monocytes and macrophages, causing disease. Although here I've kind of implied that it's just the genetic mutations of the virus that cause the disease, it's really important to note that other factors are at play here. So they'd be host factors. Um, such as the immune response to the virus, and also environmental factors which dictate load of the virus. So the lesion of FIP is pyogranulomatous perivasculitis, and because it can affect practically any tissue or organ, that's why the clinical signs can be so wide-ranging and varied. Unfortunately with FIP, there's a virtually 100% mortality rate. So let's talk a little bit more about the pathogenesis. So as I mentioned, the cat's initially infected with FECV. It may get diarrhea, it may get no clinical signs at all. The infection spread via the fecal oral route and it's ubiquitous. So in regular household cats, around 40% will be seropositive for FECV. Um, when you look at populations in catteries and shelters, that number can rise to 100%. So it really can be endemic in some populations. So there are a few possible outcomes of FECV. The cat can recover completely, but it's important to remember that it isn't immune for life, so it can become reinfected. 
the cat can be persistently infected but asymptomatic. So it doesn't develop FIP, but it sheds FECV in its feces and acts as a source of infection for other cats. For the very unlucky 5 to 10 percent, FIP develops. And as I said, this relies on enabling mutations of the virus, so mutations that give it tropism for monocytes and macrophages, and mutations that allow it to replicate efficiently in these cells. But it's really, really important to remember that it also relies on host factors, so the immune system of the host, and also environmental factors that contribute to load, so things like hygiene and crowding. So 60 to 70% of cats with FIP will get the wet form, and the remainder will get the dry form. So, wet FIP is characterised by effusions, so it's the typical kind of FIP that you'd think of, whereas dry FIP is characterised by granulomatous lesions within organs. However, it's really important to remember that these are two ends of a spectrum, and actually quite often cats will fall somewhere in between and have a mix of the two different kinds of FIP. Wet FIP is thought to be driven by a humoral immune response, so it's kind of an antibody-driven thing, whereas dry FIP is more of a cellular or mixed immune response. Wet FIP also has a type 3 hypersensitivity component to it, so you get um, formation of antibody-antigen complexes, and these cause vascular inflammation and damage and contribute to the leakage of fluid out of vessels. Cats with dry FIP do tend to do a bit better, so their clinical signs are milder and they tend to survive for weeks to months, whereas cats with wet FIP really do only survive for days to weeks post-diagnosis. So, we've learned about how FECV can be transmitted horizontally and we know it's spread via the faecal oral route, but can FIPV jump from cat to cat? And this is a really important point because it really dictates how we manage cats with the virus. So my answer is it's possible, but it's unlikely to happen. This is because horizontal transmission of FIPV would rely on FIPV being shed in the cat's feces. And we know that this usually isn't the case. So if cats are shedding coronavirus in their feces when they're infected with FIP, it is often just the FECV that they're shedding or nothing at all. It also relies on a really high viral load, so cats would have to be in very close proximity to each other, sharing litter trays, perhaps immunosuppressed, allowing the virus to replicate rapidly. And it would also rely on an inadequate immune response. So this is partly dictated by genetics, partly by things like immunosuppression and stress as well. So the populations where um, you're most likely to get horizontal transmission of FIPV are litters of kittens. So if a single kitten comes down with FIP, it's thought that at least in some cases, the kitten will directly give the FIPV to other kittens. And as you can imagine, these kittens are often overcrowded, they're stressed, they're perhaps not in the most hygienic conditions, and they're immunosuppressed by virtue of being young as well. So the implications of this are that if an owner comes to you with a cat and you diagnose that cat with FIP, you don't necessarily have to keep that cat in quarantine. So if the owner wants to take the cat home, if it has um, adult healthy cats at home and wants to take the cat home, then they can. As long as you warn them that there is a very low risk of transmission, then it's absolutely fine for owners to take that cat home and look after it at home. So the outcome for Rory the owners opted to do just that, so they took Rory home for a couple of days, tried him on steroids, but unfortunately he deteriorated rather quickly. And he had to come back a couple of days later for euthanasia. So they opted to carry out a post-mortem, and it was found that he had um, effusion in both his thorax and his abdomen. He also had multifocal white nodules covering abdominal organs. So this demonstrates a mix of both wet and dry type lesions. On histopath, he was found to have pyogranulo you know, sorry, pyogranulomatous inflammation, which is the typical lesion. Um, and also it was positive for coronavirus antigen when it was stained. And this gives us a definitive diagnosis of FIP, albeit a bit too late. So in summary, 
FIP is a fatal disease of cats caused by FIP virus, which is a virulent biotype of feline coronavirus, and it's thought that it emerges within the host from FECV. So the lesion of FIP is widespread pyogranulomatous perivasculitis, which is mediated by, by uh, virus-infected monocytes and macrophages. So both virus and host factors determine where the disease occurs, and I should also put in here environmental factors, so determining things like viral load. Cats can present with wet, dry or mixed forms of the disease, and horizontal transmission of the disease rarely, if ever, occurs, but if it does, it will be in litters of kittens. So I want to say thank you very much for listening. If you'd like any more information, please do look at these references and stick around for part two where we'll be talking about diagnosis, treatment and prevention.